September 1st, we pay in our assessed dues of $35 per member of record on the 1st of July when our new year meets. So of course we paid our $35 dues, but in addition to that annual assessment, we also as a club make the maximum contribution suggested for some uh, D6000 initiatives. So we uh, send $500 in voluntary contribution for the Iowa MOST project and that's Miles of Smiles team. And that purpose is to promote and organize efforts of, of District 6,000 Rotarians and non-Rotary members, medical personnel specifically, to work with Rotarians in Weiwei Unongo, Guatemala. And I practiced that about 10 times last night. <laughs> Weiwei Unongo. So uh, don't hold me to exact pronunciation. But at, at that area, for several years, uh, we've got teams of people, Rotarians and, and medical staff, providing free cleft lip and cleft palate surgery and also uh, cataract surgery and other medical needs that have been identified for the community. So we're part of that initiative. We also contribute $500 in voluntary contribution to the Youth Services Fund, and that fund gives young people from our communities the opportunity to experience the value of humanitarian service through Rotary projects and working with Rotarians. And thirdly, each year we contribute $500 voluntarily to the Disaster Relief Humanitarian Services Fund. And that's to be sure that District 6000 has funds available in a timely manner when a disaster or a humanitarian need arises. So, next time, when the quarterly issue of the District 6000 news arrives in your mailbox and you flip through that, you see some of those pictures, please uh, know that you're part of making that possible. And thank you for helping us have these uh, very worthwhile ongoing initiatives at the district level, pulling all of our clubs together. And now I'd like to invite Bob Bedrill to make his way to the podium so that he can provide a moment of inspiration followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and the, the four-way test. And also want to be sure that you know that Bob is serving as our new member orientation and member engagement committee chair this week, this year. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, President Becky. <clears throat> so I thought for a moment of inspiration today I bring up some inspirational quotes. Uh, who has inspired you in life? It could be your family, your faith, friends, a coach, a teacher, a moment in nature, a boss or others that have touched your life in a positive way. We all have moments of inspiration that lead to creativity, personal, personal action, and fulfillment. Poet Amanda Gorman said, there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Booker T. Washington, if you want to lift yourself up, lift up someone else. Winston Churchill, attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Walt Disney, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Steve Jobs, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. <laughs> Albert Einstein, a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. And lastly, Ronald Reagan, we can't help everyone, but everyone can't help someone. So if you stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty Justice for all. Four-way test. Is it true? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Is it? Now, 
greet your fellow Rotarians. So, Nicola Dance, the new Dean of the St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral and the guest of Hal Chase. Great. And Elijah Kane, Trust Officer at Bankers Trust and guest of Mason Powers. Welcome. And Andrea Solomon, Director of Development at the Des Moines Symphony and guest of Doug Dorner. Yay! Welcome, It's a special day because we're here at Rotary, but it's especially special for Susan Schomburg, who's celebrating her birthday with us. Happy birthday, Susan. <laughs> okay, it's tumbler time, so please consider donating $5 to the cup, unless you have a dollar sign on your name badge, and that means you've contributed $150 to take care of that for the year. But even if you have, you can always put some money in the cups and donate more to our Rotary Club and Des Moines Foundation. And thank you for your continued support. And now, 1911 Challenge. Okay, I did it. Last night, I was there at my kitchen table, adding up the times I've come to Rotary and the club meetings I've gone to and the activities and the events. And I want to have a little fun with that and say, I know there's people out there that can beat me in this point score. Because I came up with Oh, I did the $150 donation to the, the cup, so I've got 150 points there, and most of you have that already, right? Got to remember to put that on your tally, 150 points. Easy peasy. And then how many club meetings or events or get-togethers or committee meetings have you attended? Holy moly. Okay, I am president, so I do show up for <laughs> most of these meetings. I grant that. But I missed three. Kevin was so nice to um, step in for me. And even at that, I've made it to 11 meetings, and then four committee meetings, and we've had some board meetings, and we've had six events, counting the Second Chance Tuesdays. And here we got our, our, our uh, charter member that's been at every Second Chance Tuesday, Dick, right there. He's made it to every single one of those. So you've already racked up 75 points just for doing that. <laughs> Having a beer with us, wow. It's all about the beer. That's right, and they do have good beer, I have to say. And then if we donate additional funds to our Rotary International Foundation or to our own foundation, we get many. And remember when I had the little faux pas a few uh, weeks back and I, I messed up and talked about our club being club number 29 or 25, so I had to pony up uh, $27 to our foundation for my mistake. But guess what? That gave me 54 points because you get two points for every dollar you pay. So, okay, adding that up finally, you guys gave me 100 points. There were two meetings where nobody signed up to do our inspiration. And so I did it and just got 100 points right there, 50 points reached. So if you can do any of these things and sign up, I'd like you to chase me or maybe you're already ahead. Let me know where you are 
but I am as of today when this day ends at 904 points towards 1,900 limits. So I just want us to have some fun with it. And if you've already beat my clock, let me know. I think that's pretty cool. And anybody that's invited a guest today or earlier gets 500 points for that. When that guest converts into a member, you get another 500 points. So you'll be smoking me. <laughs> okay? All right. That's enough on our little uh, competition here. I would also like to uh, let you know that where in the world was Club 27? Uh, again, Second Chance Tuesday, we were there at Big Grove having a good time. With the, oh, who's had enough to be? Okay, Kitty took the picture. She was also there. But if you want one of these, whether you're going out of town or you're doing just something fun around town, take it. Have your picture taken and, and let us know. Send the picture to Kitty. Get the post uh, pop-up sign from Kitty. And we want to have fun sharing what are the fun things and activities that our folks are doing. And now, uh, Ann Starr was going to be here to talk one more time about the coat drive that's underway for Orchard Place. And she had a business uh, emergency come up. So I am going to want to say thank you on behalf of the committee, of the current service committee, for all of the coats that you've already contributed towards. And you realize that we have already contributed $3,999 which will purchase 160 coats. But so isn't that fantastic? Thank you so much. I will be adding aside, there is still an additional need for a total of 410, so if anybody's interested, they, they still are looking for another 250. But fantastic, but just a dollar short of $4,000 towards coats. So that's just wonderful. And I want to thank you again so much. And now, Jonathan Kingsbury will introduce our guest speaker. Jonathan. Greetings. Uh, I'm Jonathan Kingsbury, uh, close to one full year here as a member. And uh, today I'm honored to have this chance to introduce our speaker, uh, Mike O'Donnell, the director of Cirrus at Iowa State University. Some of you may know, but for those that don't, Cirrus stands for Center for Industrial Research and Service. It's a wonderful organization that started in 1963, and they provide support for Iowa businesses, much like my company, Instapro. Instapro has a history of utilizing Cirrus for advancing our technology for <coughs> producing nutrient-dense animal feed ingredients. <coughs> Excuse me. Cirrus, to me, is a great example of how the combination of government, academia, and business can deliver opportunities and results for the people of the great state of Iowa. Mike is originally from Massachusetts, uh, but has lived now in Ames for 15 years with his wife and two children. He studied at Bucknell University, where he received both his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering. He furthered his education with a master's in business administration at Iowa State University. Prior to joining Cirrus, Mike worked at Lockheed Martin and Sunbeam in a variety of domestic and international roles in supply chain management quality, engineering, and program management. And I learned at lunch today that we share something in common. We both lived in Sydney, Australia for two years uh, on different expat assignments, so a, lot of, a very small world here. Um, at Cirrus, Mike led the manufacturing extension program, a partnership program for a decade, establishing the Cirrus Digital Manufacturing Lab, powered by Alliant en Energy, launching the Iowa Sustainable Business Forum, and expanding Cirrus's services in strategy and growth. Please join me in welcoming to the podium our guest speaker, Mike O'Donnell. Thank you for having me on this, I'd say, beautiful Thursday. <laughs> uh, I can see some of the ground down there, at least. Uh, from, from back over in those seats, it looks much worse than it does from up here. You can see a little bit. A little bit better. Uh, oh, my clicker. Oh. <laughs> Step number one. Remember to turn this on, right? Okay, thank you for having me. And I am going to do my best to continue to remember to talk into the microphone. I am one of those people who likes to walk around and when he talks and look at different people. So I'm going to do my best here, and uh, hopefully I will not lose track of the microphone as we talk here. Uh, so I wanted to give you a chance today to learn a little bit about what's going on in manufacturing here in Iowa, 
both today and where we think it's going to go over the next several years. So how many people here have heard of Cirrus before? That's great. How many actually know what we do? Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I'll sort of raise my hand. We're, we're not great at communicating that. So uh, we're, we're broad at Cirrus. Our job is to make Iowa industry better through applied research, education, and technical assistance. What that really means is we work one-on-one -on -one with businesses to help them implement change when they're facing tough problems. That's really most of what we do at Cirrus. We do other things with workforce and engaging students into companies. We do things with research with faculty, but most of what we do is one-on-one -on -one with mid-sized companies to make them better. Uh, where we aim, where everything, where all of our stakeholders expect us to be and what we expect of ourselves is to create financial results for Iowa companies. Uh, one of our biggest points of pride is over the last five years, our clients have reported $3 billion of results from working with us. Uh, and we've worked with 4,400 different businesses across every county in Iowa. So uh, we are spread across the state and we're here to make companies better. That's all you're gonna hear about Sears. Now I'm gonna talk about all the fun stuff. So I wanna tell you a little bit about where manufacturing is today, what we're seeing, and then where it's going over the next five to 10 years. Uh, some of this text here is a little small to read here, but uh, manufacturing is actually the largest industry in Iowa. Um, yes, a lot of what we do is related to the ag sector, right? But most of our ag sector is actually classified as manufacturing, right? We process food, chemicals, ethanol, uh, those types of things. That's all manufacturing. So manufacturing is about 16 to 17% of Iowa's economy. We have 215,000 <laughs> people in Iowa working in manufacturing. Uh, and my favorite thing about that is, if you look at US manufacturing, there's this perception, and, and in some cases a reality, that manufacturing has slowly faded away. Uh, we have more people working in manufacturing today than we did in 1990 in Iowa. So manufacturing in Iowa has performed really strongly for 30 plus years. Uh, and we're actually in a really good position for continued growth of manufacturing here in the state. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. What do we make here in Iowa? Uh, it, none of it's really a surprise, right? We make food and beverage products. That's about a third of all manufacturing in Iowa, right? Taking the agriculture products and converting them into higher value things. We make a lot of machinery. Most of that machinery is in the ag space in the food and beverage space, uh, but we also make a lot of other types of machinery. We make a lot of chemicals, and we build a lot of metal products that go into the machinery and the chemical production space too. One of the things we do at Cirrus is every other year, we conduct a survey of manufacturing executives across the state. So we have about 220 different companies across Iowa that respond to this survey, and we ask them a lot of different questions. One of the questions we ask them is just about profitability, not their exact number, but what, what range are they in on the return on sales? And, and this kind of shows you the track from 2019, 2021 to 2023. And what we're seeing is a compression of profits. That shouldn't be surprising to anybody, right? Labor costs have gone up. Material costs have gone up. Uh, one of the things we know is that in 2021, there was so much price opportunity out there and so many, so much spending out there that you could capture some additional profit here and there. And so, so companies did okay in 2021. Manufacturers across Iowa are feeling the squeeze right now. So historically, you would see companies fairly well spread across <coughs> zero to 20% in terms of where their return on sales was. Uh, right now, we're seeing it compressed in that zero to 10% range, right? The good news is we have less companies that are losing money uh, than we have had historically. That is a very positive thing. Uh, but we have less companies who are making what I would call moderate returns in that 15 to 20 and higher range, right? So those higher return companies, they're getting pushed down into the moderate range. Uh, that creates some stress on industry, right? It is going to create some struggles over the next few years. And I know you can't read this, and I, you're not supposed to be. I'm gonna zoom in in one second. But I want you to look at uh, just the colors and the dots, right? One of the things we ask is, what's gonna prevent you from growing in the next five years? And we, we provide this huge list of potential 
issues that could impact companies. You'll see when you look at this, right, the vast majority of them are right in that neutral to disagree range, right? These are day-to-day -day issues that manufacturers across Iowa deal with, manage, and are able to get through. But then you've got those things out on the right. So what are they? Um, we've historically referred to them as the big four. Uh, hourly workforce, labor costs, raw material costs, and healthcare costs. Those are the four that ever since we've done this survey have been the top four. Now, we've got another one that's starting to separate from the pack there too, availability of technical salaried workforce. Uh, that is something that if you peel back the data and you look at it, that is primarily a rural Iowa problem, right? So one of the things that's, that's been fascinating as we've done the survey for almost a decade here is that every time we ask questions, there isn't a huge difference in terms of the responses of rural companies versus urban companies. That's starting to separate and it's separating on the technical salary workforce. Companies in rural parts of the state are struggling finding and retaining salary workforce in the technical space. Um, one thing that's important to know on this is, is all four of these, the healthcare, labor, raw material, and hourly workforce, uh, they're standing out there. They have gotten much better in the past two years, right? So all of these were, in fact, all of them were up and beyond where you see the hourly workforce is today. Uh, two years ago, materials was far and away number one. That has subsided substantially. Uh, and we are hearing some softening of the labor market for hourly workforce. And the general consensus that we hear as we're starting to popularize these numbers with companies is that it's getting better, but not good. One of the other questions we ask companies a lot about is, what have you implemented and how did it perform compared to expectations? We ask it about 25 different initiatives across the entire spectrum of the business, from wellness programs to things like cybersecurity and everything in between. Uh, one of the things you'll see in terms of the most growth in the last eight years, uh, cybersecurity is now the most implemented initiative in all of Iowa manufacturers. Uh, never would have believed that when we started doing the survey. In fact, cybersecurity wasn't even on the survey when we started. Right? So we've only been tracking cybersecurity since 2017, and that's still the most improved, most implemented thing since then. Uh, 3D CAD modeling, quality systems are really seeing a resurgence. Robotics and automation, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about where technology is going in there. Uh, and then 3D printing, and one of the things, you know, somebody had told me 10 years ago that 45% of manufacturers in Iowa we're using 3D printing in their production, I never would have believed you. And that's where we are today. It's about 45%, which is really cool, right? And they use it for a whole lot of different things. And I'm gonna show you some of the, the examples of where it is and where it's going in a minute. But those are, those are what's trending really in manufacturing. And four out of the five are technology because that's what's moving fast these days. And that's where companies are really spending a lot of time and money especially to augment their limited workforce. So now where's manufacturing going? When we talk about manufacturing and the direction and the pace and the things to look at, we really talk about four different things. One, we've got changes in terms of deglobalization and regionalization, demographics, both within Iowa, within the US and globally are major issues. Sustainability and climate and technology are the four biggest things driving what manufacturing is and where it's going. Uh, I could honestly spend until at least five or six tonight talking about any one of these, uh, but I know you don't want that. So I'm gonna highlight two of them. And if anybody ever wants to talk about where these are going and what we're seeing, happy to talk offline. Um, Deglobalization and regionalism. So it's a messy world right now, right? 
uh, there are a lot of changes going on. We've got Ukraine, I, I sent these slides in Friday. If I had sent them in later than that, uh, I would have added Israel to this slide, right? Uh, we've got constant conflicts starting to grow around the world. Uh, we have our, uh, we'll call them disputes, our trade disputes with China, right? And the challenges with uh, what can and should we make in China versus what can and should we make in different parts of the world. You've got things like Brexit starting to take into reality. And you've got the bipartisan infrastructure law that is really starting to impact the streets today. And then there's so many more things going on and so many other similar things. Is But it's just this general trend towards we're going to make stuff locally and we're going to make it here. Um, how's that being realized? This is my favorite chart of anything that's out there today. Uh, this line is construction put in place by manufacturers in the United States going back to the early 2000s. And I know that might not be easy to see, but that is a near vertical line in the last few years. Uh, this isn't announcements, this isn't anything other than spending by manufacturers to construction companies to build new or additions to their factories. I'm going to put a plug in for my favorite online data tool, FRED, it's a St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve tool. Go ahead to that site and you can type in U.S. construction, manufacturing spending in construction. The chart will pop up if you ever want it or I'd have, be happy to send it to you. Um, that near vertical line is not done. So there's a couple components to that line. One is inflation, right? So that, inf that line right there is 30% high artificially, right? This is actual dollars, not inflation adjusted dollars. So construction inflation is in that 30% range for manufacturing buildings. So not 30% off from that line in the last couple of years, that's still a pretty steep curve, right? Uh, what that is, is companies moving products and production back to the US. It's also the beginning of construction being put in place for the CHIPS Act, right? So this is the movement of semiconductors and related products and processes back to the US. Uh, I would argue that this is just the very beginning of that curve for the CHIPS Act. Uh, when this data was collected, CHIPS Act money was just starting to be released. So most of the CHIPS Act money hasn't even hit here. A lot of the incentives for the CHIPS Act, they're, they're 20 to 30% incentives. So the company's putting in 70 to 80% of the capital in there. That will show up in this chart too. Uh, we are going to continue to see construction spending and manufacturing probably for the next three to five years. Uh, and I'm, I'm fairly bullish on that uh, and, and optimistic. So let's talk technology. When we talk technology at Cirrus, what we talk a lot about is the fourth industrial revolution. So that's the process of going from today where we have fairly decent electronics and programmable logic circuits in the high volume production world and everything else is done with tools and mostly modern equipment. What we're seeing now is a variety of different technologies that are all maturing at the same time. And on their own, they're really cool, they're really good, they add a lot of value to companies. Where they add the most value is when used in combination with each other, right? We talk about things like augmented and virtual reality, right? Five years ago, companies putting in an augmented reality training system, you were looking at about two years of development time and a couple hundred thousand dollars to get there. Uh, today, they're combining it with things like cloud computing, integrated systems, simulation tools, and they've, they've brought that cost down to about $20,000, right? So you've seen a, in the last five years about a 10x reduction in putting an augmented reality training system on your factory floor. My expectation is that's gonna go down by another factor of five to 10 in the next five years, right? These tools are getting so fast, so cheap, so capable, uh, and I'm gonna show you kind of how they combine in some different ways. But what's really important here, while all these technologies are great and fun and neat and you can do so much more with so little, you still need to know how to make products, right? You still need to know how do you melt metal and put it into an injection mold, right? You still need to know how do you bend things, how do you assemble things, right? So it's not just the pressure of learning technology, it's also the pressure of being able to understand how you actually make stuff 
and not losing that as people retire from the workforce. One thing that I can't ignore, artificial intelligence, right? Uh, AI is looming over all of this. Uh, it requires all of this and it can help all of this. We're still really getting our arms around it internally in terms of how it's impacting clients, but it is impacting businesses across the state. Uh, my counterpart up in Wisconsin, they just finished a survey of executives in manufacturing up there, and 51% of executives said that they don't believe that AI will have any impact on their business in the next decade. Um, <laughs> they're wrong. Uh, it's, it's that simple. Um, will it be a major impact? I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns there. there. Will there be negative impacts? Absolutely. Will people go down bad paths? Absolutely. Uh, but AI is here to stay. Uh, we're about to go through some hard lessons, I think, when people spend a lot of money on things that may or may not work. We're gonna figure out what does work, and then you'll see another spike for it after that. Uh, but what's going on? Where, where's, where are manufacturing things going next? Well, uh, two things that are new to most people. Uh, collaborative robots, also called cobots. These are flexible, cheaper, safer robots that can generally work along people. Uh, a typical industrial robot, you're looking at two to $300,000 for the robot itself. A cobot, you're looking at forty to $60,000 for that same robot. It's slower, it has a lower payload, uh, but it also has a video camera on it. And you can program it with drag and drop box programming, right? You don't need to know code to do it. Uh, that's out there today. You go into a company, you will see companies, uh, especially in the automotive sector, with 40, 50, 60 of these in their factory. Uh, I was at a company yesterday that has five of these doing welding. Um, they're out there, they're working. Uh, you also see things like autonomous mobile robots. These are robots for material handling that move around your factory. Uh, those are out there today, they are being used. They've been being used uh, in forward-thinking manufacturers for five to 10 years. Uh, what you will see in the next one to two years is those two combined. So you're gonna have a robot arm on a robot that's going to move around your factory and do things for you. Right? They exist today, there are prototypes, they are being tested, they are in some factories today. These are very limited use now. You will see that move very quickly in the next few years. 3D printing is really fun. Uh, what you see there in the, the middle picture is a metal injection mold. So it's, it's just a plastic injection molding, but we printed it with metal. Stainless steel 3D printing. Uh, we did that mold on campus, and it's being used to make tools, right? Like I said, 45% of manufacturers are doing 3D printing. The technology that has very quietly matured in the background is 3D scanning, right? So you can buy a 3D scanner now, and you can hold it in your hand, that, that nice little scanner right, whoops, press the wrong button. I shouldn't be trusted with technology. Um, that 3D scanner right there, uh, you can pick it up in your hand, wave it around, you could take something like this, wave it around, and it can capture a 3D model, and it can go from what's called a point cloud, which is a bunch of little dots, into a model in the software, and then you can print it. Right, so you can essentially get to the point of a copy machine for parts. Uh, we do that today. It's low volume, it's not cheap. Uh, we had a company come to us with a 30 year old part that they don't have prints for, they don't have tools for. Uh, it was broken. We glued it together, we scanned it, we printed it, they had a new part. That's real. It is not high volume. Give it a couple years. Uh, the other set of things we're seeing is the set of technologies and capabilities and systems to support the person on the production floor, right? We don't have enough people. Uh, in Iowa, we definitely don't have enough people in manufacturing. Uh, if you're in the Des Moines area, it's not terrible right now, and it will stay perfectly okay. If you're in rural parts of the state, this is likely the best it's going to be for the next decade. Rural parts of Iowa are gonna have real struggles with people. So the question becomes, how can we make individuals wildly more productive? Uh, there are things like exoskeletons. We're using exoskeletons with companies today, right? These are simple passive exoskeletons, cost in the range of $6,000 to 
to take all of the weight off from somebody doing things like screwing things in up high, right, and those types of operations. Uh, you've got safety tools like Make You Safe, which if you guys haven't heard from Gabe Glenn at Make You Safe, this is an Iowa company. Uh, he's a great speaker, so that's, a, that's a, a good one if you guys haven't seen Gabe and what he does. You've got sensors on machines, you've got heads up displays, you've got tools to help people to know what to build when. You're making people on the floor so much more capable and productive than they were before. Uh, and in terms of technology, capability, and productivity, one of the things when I was putting these slides together, I said, man, I wish I could get a picture of somebody on a shop floor with a superhero cape. <laughs> so, so I went over to Adobe, and they have a tool called Firefly that's generative AI, and I said, make a picture of a person on a manufacturing floor with a superhero cape. Uh, and this is what it generated. Uh, AI is useful. Uh, those of you who know me knew I would have poked around the internet for half an hour at least to find a picture that was close enough. That took less than a minute, right? Those are some of the things that AI can do that really works today. If you look closely at the picture, there's some weird parts about it, but it works good enough for a slide this size. Um, so where are things going? Price is get going down, size is going down, capability and connectedness of technology is going up. Uh, on the left there is the first commercial 3D printer from the late 1980s uh, up in Minnesota. Uh, in today's dollars, that would have cost $800,000. Uh, you can get a printer. We've got, uh, this is a Prusa on the right. We have four of them in our office. Uh, they're $700. They're much more capable than that $800,000 printer. In fact, they're much more capable than a $500,000 printer was five years ago. And some of our team prefer to use it than the $300,000 printers that they can buy today. Uh, depending on the application, you can be printing tools for your factory floor for $700. Now, you gotta have engineers for that because that $700 model, you have to put it together yourself. Uh, if you want one sent to you assembled, it's $1,000. It is still unbelievably cheap, right? The ability of machines and technologies to support you on the production floor and in making products has been spectacularly changed in the last few years. So what are we expecting to see with all this technological change? Well, first, uh, moving from low-cost, high-wage, or moving into the, the low-cost, high-wage world, right? We can have high wage jobs and produce low cost parts at the same time. That's something we could not do before, right? You're going to have highly integrated systems, high automation, and very flexible staff to do so. Supply chains are becoming more and more vertically integrated. And we're going to see this is this last one's my guess, right? You're going to start to see less regional specialization in terms of globe and more regional everything, right? So one of the things that we outsourced to China uh, 20 years ago that are gonna come back to <coughs> the US, right? And by regional, I don't mean Des Moines region, I mean the US, right? So you're gonna see more stuff come back here. Uh, we are seeing that happen, we're seeing trends to that, both at the large intentional global corporation level and at the local level too. And that is all I have. What questions do you have? Oh, yes. Uh, when a uh, small business manufacturer and, and grow Iowa is looking to sell or deliver a business, do you get involved in those transactions? So the question was, if a small business in rural Iowa is looking to sell, do we get involved in the transactions? Uh, not officially, but given our relationships, we get a lot of questions and make a lot of connections there. Uh, there is, There has historically not been a lot of business sales in terms of the manufacturing side. Uh, for the last 10 years in rural Iowa, I would expect that to change. Uh, and we are seeing that we are getting some calls. Uh, we are not business valuation experts. We are not succession experts. Uh, those teams exist in Iowa. and. Uh, on those, we tend to make the connection and get out of the way because let's let the experts do what they do. Yes. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was the lack of labor. Yep. 
I just saw a presentation by Chuck Offenberger about how he and a group of people are encouraging immigrants to come to Jefferson, Iowa. Uh, does your program have anything to do with immigration policy? So the question was, does our program have anything to do with immigration policy and in terms of businesses getting immigrants to come to various small towns, that kind of stuff? Uh, we are not a policy organization. Uh, we, we listen to the policy and we understand what's going on, but we do not drive policy. Uh, we're a university, we, we run from that as, as much as we can. But we do highlight successful practices when we see them. One of the things we see is companies partnering with other organizations in Iowa and around the US and globally, frankly, to bring in people from different places and drive immigration into their community through partnerships with business. That works. Uh, there are real struggles, real problems. You need a bought-in community. You need a lot of people in the community to step together in order to pull that off. But we have seen it work. Uh, and that is, uh, and I know our friends over at ABI will talk about this as, as long as they, they're allowed to, is uh, the business community and driving immigration reform is a key topic that we know is going on. Going back to one of your slides earlier, the, when you were talking about the profit compression, uh, is that operating profit? Uh, is that net profit, uh, free cash flow? How, how, how do you define that? So the question is how do we define uh, profit compression? So we are talking about, when we ask the question, we ask return on sales. Uh, different companies will still say that differently, right? Return on sales can mean different things for different companies. Uh, we left it fairly generic as return on sales. We don't get into things like free cash flow and that type of stuff. Yeah? Um, with things like AI and 3D printing and automation and all of those, how long do you foresee it before you know, that labor demand becomes going the other direction because we don't need humans to do it? The question is, how long do we foresee labor demand being high with AI and 3D printing and those types of things? Uh, that's a hard answer. I don't, I don't know. Um, what I would say is two things. One, on average, most of our clients that we work with would pick up 10 to 20% more people tomorrow if they could have them. So given that, right, if, if these things can create 10 to 20% productivity improvement out the door, I wouldn't see any impact on workforce. Uh, now, it creates some challenges in terms of training and upskilling some of the people, and there's gonna be some hard work that's needed there. I think you've got a ways before you're starting to see actual impacts on we don't need people anymore, uh, mainly because so much of the manufacturing workforce is old, right? In terms of they're, they're moving into that retirement age and they're not being replaced. Uh, people aren't getting into manufacturing. If you get a chance this month, go on a manufacturing day tour of your local manufacturer uh, and bring a kid. That's my, my advertisement for that. There, there will be jobs in manufacturing. They will be more technical, though, is my expectation. Yeah. Quick question. How much are you working with the community colleges? So how much are we working with the community colleges? We have a really good relationship with the colleges across the state. Uh, we fund a couple of them to do some work for us in terms of their communities and help manufacturers in their communities. Uh, we, are, we have a partnership with all 15 community colleges to try to figure out what the heck this Industry 4.0 means on uh, training for the next generation of manufacturing technology and those types of things. Uh, we, we work very well with them. We're not in the training space, in the workforce training, they are. Uh, we're in the advisory type space and the technical assistance space, and we partner with them on a lot of different activities. Do you know how to speak at all about 3D printing and housing? Uh, yeah, the question was on 3D printing and housing. I'll have a short comment on that. It's really cool. Uh, it is, <laughs> there, there's some of it going on at Iowa State. Uh, I know the people who are doing it. I don't know how fast and how far it's going to come. Uh, my guess is they're going to have to make massive leaps in the technology of it, which I actually think is very doable 
and then massive leaps on the market acceptance of it is my guess is will people want to live in 3d printed houses uh, that is a challenge I think that people are going to have to think about yeah. uh, Mike wonderful presentation thank, thank you. you for coming today um, I'm curious about the possible intersection of, of manufacturers um, providing 3D printers to their customers at the customer's facilities so that the customers can print on demand the parts that would have been manufactured uh, but can have a license to, to do that and utilize kind of like a software as a service model. Do you know any manufacturers that are moving in that direction? So the, the question is, is there a software as a service model where uh, companies can print, essentially license the ability to print their supplier's product on there? Um, the one example I've seen of that is in California, there was a Lowe's store where you could print parts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that that was successful, and I wouldn't have expected it to. This was five or six years ago. Um, I would be surprised if you don't see something in that space, uh, but it's going to be messy because companies, if they don't print the part, they don't necessarily want to uh, guarantee that it worked, right? Uh, and they don't want their customers printing the part because the customer can say, wait a second, I don't need you anymore, right? There's, there's some challenges there, right? And, and especially with 3D scanners, the idea of reverse engineering 3D printed parts becomes extremely simple. Uh, there are going to be a lot of challenges there in the next few years. Uh, I do know that there are Navy ships that are deployed internationally that are printing their own spare parts. That is, that is something that is out there. So it's being done in the field and they're, they're printing spare parts in metal right now in the field. Uh, so it's out there. Will it work in a B2B business model? Somebody's gonna have to break something for it to work, but I suspect somebody will someday. Any other questions? Mike? Yes. Let's go. You said I believe that blank will last, will uh, limit the ability to grow over the last five years. Yes. That's a list of things like that was the big cost list. and all that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. technology and innovation uh, looming around us and also as a token of our appreciation we have donated a book in your honor to the Des Moines Public Library and your book will become part of the Rotary Rosie Reader Band collection and our club donated $40,000 back in 2020 to purchase this van that travels around the Des Moines neighborhood so thank you again I skipped a paragraph before Mike came up to talk. I need to remind everybody that we've got another community service project this month. We still need volunteers for Saturday, October 28th at the Des Moines uh, Botanical Garden, their Trick or Trees event. You heard Rich Leopold talking about this a few times. And the time commitment is from 9.45 a.m. to 2, 12.30 uh, just afternoon. It'll be a great fun time, so if you can join us to help with that event, uh, you can sign up in the lobby or online. And now, upcoming events. So in addition to our every Thursday at noon meeting, we promise you that there'll be two other opportunities every single month to do something with other Rotarians. And uh, our, our opportunities just keep racking up and we're just so happy to uh, be able to be sure that uh, we can offer things for you to join in with. So. Uh, you can always find information on your table or at the badge boxes. But on October 20th, this is great, the ribbon cutting for our 2022 uh, $40,000 community grant recipient. Again, we'll be at the Des Moines Botanical Garden and that nature play area that we funded for $40,000 is gonna have its ribbon cutting day. 9 to 10 a.m. There will be light uh, coffee and light refreshments, light morning type refreshments. And we are requesting RSVP so the Botanical Garden can plan for that. And please let Kitty know. And if you've got any little ones in your life and they can come out on Friday morning and be there and check, test out this new play area, that would be really fun to see that at the ribbon cutting. 
Then also on the 28th Saturday, we've got our Trunk or Trees event. So want to be sure to help support our community uh, volunteer uh, committee, our community service committee, and Susan and then your team have been doing such an outstanding job providing this opportunity. So if you can support them at the at the Botanical Garden for that, it'll be some fun times. Now remember that you and any guests can always come to Rotary and you need to RSVP though that Wednesday morning before by 9 a.m. And you cannot register your guests online. You do need to just go through Kitty on that so that we're sure that we uh, know they're coming and have a name badge for them. And look what's coming up for us at our treat. Uh, the next time, October 19th, Scott Marrier, who is with the Iowa Department of Transportation, director of that Iowa DOT, on October 26th, our very own Sue Woody, uh, director of the Des Moines Public Library and a, a great Rotary Club Des Moines member and chair of the Community Service Committee this year. And then finally, on November 2nd, Michael, Miguel McCoy, Metro Waste Director. And I don't know if I said that right, if it's Michael or Michael. Michael. Michael, thank you. Okay, great. So Michael will be here. Tell us about what's going on in the Metro Community Waste uh, world. And I just want to thank you so much for being with us today and for being a vital part of what makes this Rotary Club of Des Moines the club number 27 where we mean business. And I want to thank you, uh, Doug. Where are you, Doug? Oh, Doug's not here, sorry. Other Doug. <laughs> we thought we were going to have a new member to introduce and he couldn't make it as a, due to an emergency. But we are delighted to have all of you here. And until we meet again, Let's get out there and have fun and do good in the name of Rotary. We are adjourned. Thank you.